Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephen Padre, the Communications Manager at the Primary Care Collaborative, and I'd like to welcome you to our June webinar titled Behavioral Health and Primary Care During and After COVID-19. This month's webinar is one in a series of webinars on primary care and COVID-19 that we've been doing for the past few months. And next month's webinar will also be part of that series. Look for the announcement in the next day or so, but the theme of that webinar will be health plans and practices that have weathered the storm during the pandemic in terms of receiving advanced payments and other ways. Uh, this webinar is hosted by the Primary Care Collaborative. A quick overview of who we are. We are a nonprofit multi-stakeholder organization that unifies and engages diverse stakeholders, promotes policies, shares best practices to support the growth of high-performing care. We are a membership organization and we have over 60 organizations that are committed to their mission, plus many supporters besides those, those core 60 organizations. We are dedicated to advancing an effective and efficient health system built on a strong foundation of primary care and the patient-centered medical home. Here's the uh, agenda for today's webinar that I'll let you take a look at while I uh, go through a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, all lines will be automatically muted, and we ask that you please use the chat feature to type questions. Questions from the audience will be addressed after a panel discussion, uh, but feel free to send in questions at any time during the webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording and the slides will be posted within 48 hours after the end of this webinar. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator of this webinar, who will be speaking and uh, moderating the uh, rest of the webinar. Before I hand it over to him, a uh, uh, word of introduction about him. Uh, Dr. Arthur Evans, Jr. is Executive Vice President and CEO of the American Psychological Association. In that position, he heads the leading scientific and professional organization representing psychology in the United States, with nearly 115,700 7, 115, researchers, educators, clinicians, consultants, and students as its members. So over to you, Dr. Evans. Good. Thank you very much, and welcome, everyone, to this what I know is going to be a very uh, interesting and exciting webinar. Um, what I'm going to do is give a quick overview, and then I'm going to, uh, going to um, introduce our panelists, and they're going to get right into their presentations. And we'll have a, few, a little bit of a dialogue, but we really want to get to your questions. So let me set the stage first by just talking about what many of you, particularly those of you who are behavioral health professionals know. We are in an unprecedented time for the mental health of our nation. Uh, we're in the midst of a health pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen for over 100 years in this country. Uh, there, that pandemic is causing a lot of anxiety, fear, uncertainty, uh, and the normal coping mechanisms that we use to um, when we're stressed and when we're experiencing these kinds of um, challenges, we're not able to tap into, namely um, the social support that we typically rely on when we're um, having these, these kinds of challenges. Uh, in addition to that, we have an economic crisis, and we know through a lot of research that uh, economic downturns are related to a whole host of mental health challenges, including increased rates of suicide, uh, depression, uh, other mental health challenges, substance use. Uh, and then on top of that, we are experiencing uh, a lot of social protests uh, and unrest related to racism in our country. Uh, and when you add all of these things up, it really paints the picture of uh, a nation that is under a tremendous amount of stress. And in fact, uh, the American Psychological Association does a uh, a survey each year, and uh, since we've been in the, co in the COVID pandemic, we've been doing um, monthly uh, updates to that survey that looks at the stress in the country. And over 80% of Americans are significantly stressed by what they're experiencing. Uh, PCC also is, has been surveying um, um, its members and, and people who are going to their website, and clinicians are reporting increased um, concern and anticipation of increases in substance use, anxiety, depression, 
uh, many of the challenges that they would see normally, but, see, but expecting to see some significant increases in that. Um, uh, and there, are, there is uh, growing research that is showing that the symptomatology that people are experiencing is pretty significant. So all of that is saying that we have a crisis unlike any crisis that we've had before, and we have an outstanding uh, panel of individuals that are going to talk about primary care and COVID and what we can do as a nation to address these serious challenges. And so I'm going to introduce our panelists. I'm going to start with Dr. Jack Westfall, uh, who's in his position. He is director of the Robert Graham Center for Policy Studies in the Family Medicine uh, and, and Primary Care. He is also one of the authors of Projected, of Projected Deaths of Despair from COVID-19. He is also a family doctor in Washington, D.C. After joining the faculty of the University of Colorado Department of Family Medicine, Dr. Westfall started the High Plains Research Network, a geographic community and practice-based research network in rural and frontier Colorado. Dr. Westfall was, one of the, was on the faculty of the University of Colorado for over 20 years, serving in various positions. His research interests include rural health, linking primary care and community health and policies, and at, in assuring a robust primary care workforce for rural, urban, and vulnerable communities. Uh, joining him is Dr. Um, ben Benjamin Miller. Uh, ben is uh, the Chief Strategy Officer at uh, Wellbeing Trust, um, and he is also one of the authors of Projected Deaths of Despair from COVID-19. He's a clinical psychologist by training, and he has worked to advance mental health throughout his career. At Wellbeing Trust, he helps oversee the foundation's portfolio, ensuring alignment across grantees, overall strategy and direction, and connection of work to advance policy. The end goal is to help advance the national movement around mental health and well being. Prior to joining Wellbeing Trust, Dr. Miller spent eight years as an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, where he was the founding director of the Eugene S. Farley Jr. Health Policy Center. Uh, Dr. Miller is currently an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Stanford School of Medicine. Um, and we have with us Ms. Kelly Davis, who is Director of Peer Advocacy Supports and Services at Mental Health America, where she promotes the expansion of peer support throughout healthcare. She also leads MHA's Collegiate Mental Health Innovation Council, which is dedicated to highlighting and expanding student-led programs that fill gaps in traditional services and supports on campus. Kelly is passionate about empowerment, civil rights, positive psychology, peer support, and trauma-informed care. In 2019, and I love the name of this award, Kelly was awarded the Disruptive Innovator Award by the International Association of Peer Supporters given to young persons to a young person making positive change in mental health through a positive disruption. I love Disruptor, so we're glad to have you. <laughs> so I'm, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Ben Miller, and he's gonna be our first presenter this, this afternoon. Thanks so much, Arthur. And I will try not to disrupt too much here with my clicking through the slides. Uh, thanks, PCC, for having us on. Uh, we are really excited to talk about something that's hard to talk about what our nation is going through right now in the face of a pandemic. And what Jack and I are gonna do is to describe a little bit about the study that we've been working on and have worked on and present to you some of the findings of that, but really just set some context for Kelly and for ultimately the discussion that we're gonna have. So many of you are familiar with this, but right now there is a crisis. You're probably sitting in your rooms pretending that you're somewhere else. Uh, this is a tough time for all of us right now. And because of that, we've been able to learn a lot about ourselves as a society, as a nation. And a couple of things that we've learned. Number one, some of the, the failings that we've got in terms of public health, primary care, and mental health have just been laid bare. 
Uh, we've seen the opportunities for our country to really rise to the occasion in the middle of a pandemic. And unfortunately, because of a variety of different reasons, which we can get into today, we've not given our A game. And that's made it extremely difficult for, I think, a lot of folks that are out there that are suffering. And it's not the fault of the clinicians. We all try and do our best. It's that the system as a whole has somewhat let us down just a bit, and we have not be, been able to put the right resources into the places that people actually need it. And if you want to look at some of the concerns, Arthur did a, a wonderful job providing some high-level um, survey stats. One of the stats that I saw recently came from our youth, ages, I think, 13 to 18, and it was a 4 age survey, and um, some of you may have seen this. And this is great. 82% of the teens in this survey called on us as a society now in this moment to talk more openly about our mental health. I, I just like full stop. That to me is a symbol that the generation that's following us, the generation that really we will be you know, following in their footsteps because they're gonna be the leaders, they are already laying claim to the need for us to be talking about this. In the same survey, around 80% said that they feel like because of COVID, mental health will be an issue for the foreseeable future with our youth. What are we going to do about that? Well, as we know, and we've been studying, see if I oh, went too fast. Uh, we've had a problem in this nation for some time. Uh, we've been losing lives prematurely to drug, alcohol, and suicide for the last two decades and exponentially increasing almost every year, but really beginning to, to rise at rates that are quite disturbing in 2008 at the last Great Recession. Excuse me, the, last, the Great Recession, not the last recession, because we're about to enter into one. And so here we are in 2020, and we've not necessarily seen our country embrace fully solutions that can allow us to solve some of these problems around drug, alcohol, and suicide or the deaths of despair. 151,000 lives were lost in 2018. And you can see here, if you look at the trends going back to 99, that there was a slow, I don't wanna say a decrease, but there was a slow level in the last year of available data. And most interesting about that is if you look at why there was a slowdown in 2018, it's because you may remember that our country aggressively pursued strategies to address opioids. So we cracked down on a lot of folks, we made a lot of decisions through public policy, and it worked for a small subset of the population. It did not work for all populations. And so we continue to see some communities, specifically communities of color, that saw increases in deaths from um, opioids, whereas certain other communities like white communities saw a decrease. So we have a lot of work to do, folks. Because of these deaths of despair and because of some of the problems that already existed, it's led many of us to call this the epidemic within the pandemic. We had this massive problem happening in the country way before COVID hit. We weren't doing much about it, though we knew about it. And so now here we are in the middle of a pandemic and we still had that other problem happening. So as Jack will talk about in just a second, we feel like this is going to exacerbate some of the ongoing and underlying problems that our nation was already experiencing prior to COVID. So what we wanted to do is Wellbeing Trust in partnership with the Robert Graham Center, we just wanted to be able to look at the deaths of despair literature and say, okay, and Jack is gonna talk a whole lot more about this on the next slide. What would it look like if things didn't get better? What would it look like if our nation didn't fully embrace strategies that allowed us to address deaths of despair? How bad could this be? And Jack, why don't you go ahead and take it away and tell us a little bit about the study? Yeah, so thank you, Ben. It's uh, very nice to be here. Thank you to the Primary Care Collaborative for having us here to discuss this. It's, uh, it is, as you said, a difficult conversation. And I think <clears throat> um, we, we have to have the numbers of people on these kinds of webinars all take this back and, and converse about this stuff with their own families and friends and colleagues. Um, we really thought about how do we how do we project models for um, the future based on the past? And that's not always uh, effective, but it's a good way to get started and talk about the what if problem. So we looked at the things that relate to deaths of despair from the literature, and those were the economy, the relationship between deaths of despair and unemployment, geographic impact and variation. And then we really thought about how do we how do we capture social isolation? And how do we capture the uncertainty of daily briefings about COVID and one day being one thing and the next day being something else? Are masks good or bad? Is are drugs good or bad? What are the what are, it's it's a lot of uncertainty. Next slide. So we projected 
based on Ben, can you go to the next slide for me? So we used historic data based on the experience of the Great Recession as a baseline. During the recession, unemployment went from about 4.5% to a peak of 10% in October of 2009, and then steadily declined, um, reaching 3.5% in early 2010. This baseline for our analysis relied on an April Congressional Budget Office projection of 15 to 16% unemployment in quarter three of 2020, and an annual rate of about 10% for 2021. For this projection of the COVID recession, a peak unemployment rate of 15% is assumed. And then we modeled three po possible recoveries, either the same pattern as we saw in the recession of 2008 to 2015, second, a twice as fast recovery, or hopefully four times as fast a recovery as the Great Recession. A quicker recovery implies, of course, fewer additional deaths of despair. Now, I want to make it really clear that we're not talking about the baseline deaths of despair. We're talking about additional deaths of despair based on the COVID, the impact of COVID on the economy, social isolation, and uncertainty. Next slide, please. Can you go back one? This is a busy slide. We combined information about the 2018 baseline deaths of despair, 2018 baseline deaths of despair, projected levels of unemployment from 2020 to 2029, and we estimate the annual number of deaths based on the three selected multipliers and three recovery rates. So there's nine potential scenarios to provide some sensitivity analysis for this. Across the nine different scenarios, the additional deaths of despair range from about 27,000 additional deaths of despair, where there would be a quick recovery and the smallest impact of unemployment on deaths of despair, to over 150,000 additional deaths of despair if we have a slow recovery of the economy and the greatest impact of unemployment on deaths of despair. If recovery is four times as fast as that of the, the Great Recession, additional deaths will accumulate over four years compared to 10 years. When considering the negative impact of social isolation and uncertainty, we think maybe thinking about the 1.6% increase multiplier may be more accurate <clears throat> because we know that social isolation and uncertainty have individual impacts on well being but there's no level of population data that applies social isolation and uncertainty to deaths of despair at this time. Next slide. Here's the geographic variation related to additional deaths of despair. And I think it's important to understand that this really relates to the projections based on the 2008 recession. And you can see that the projected deaths, additional deaths of despair, the dark blue is higher rates of uh, increased deaths of despair. You see a large swath through agricultural middle America um, where there are fewer projected additional deaths of despair. And that's likely due to the fact that in 2008, during the last recession, unemployment in these areas did not increase particularly because a lot of agricultural workers are self-employed and didn't suffer from high unemployment levels. We're doing additional analyses at this time to look at what are the other impacts of economy and the farm crisis that may be impacting particularly rural agricultural communities and deaths of despair. Um, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Ben, and um, you can move on. Yeah, so we'll, we'll summarize quickly, and thanks, Jack. The, there's a lot of solutions that we looked up in the report. One of the most important things that we highlight is that since we already had a crisis and we weren't doing much about it and we're about to have a bigger crisis, what can we as a nation begin to do? And so Jack will get into some of those, those uh, recommendations in just a second. But I wanna flag something here, and I think this is really critical, and Jack alluded to this already. If this is not the most propitious time to begin to talk about issues of mental health, I don't know when will be. That we're all at a level of um, understanding and really, frankly, trying to cope with 
massive amounts of stress, change, whatever you want to describe it, and the level of distress that many folks in our communities, especially um, other, some communities other than others, it's a time for us to really embrace this notion of what could excellence look like for mental health in this country. So one of the things that we really wanted to flag uh, Wellbeing Trust has done, and then Jack will talk a little bit about Wellbeing Trust and Graham Center recommendations, is that we've been trying to push for a framework for excellence on how we can better address mental health in clinical and community settings. And we've got it in a framework and a federal policy guide that we call Healing the Nation. The previous uh, data that we were discussing, uh, we actually had a report called Pain in the Nation. And our assumptions are, well, our nation's in pain, we're suffering. And so one of the ways that we can help is through healing. And you could go to healingthenation.wellbeingtrust.org and you could see a list of federal policy recommendations that we believe do a much better job of addressing some of the issues that have plagued our nation. And one particularly for this webinar, we have an entire section just for primary care and mental health. And so you don't have to read through a whole 280 page report. You can actually click through the website, find primary care, drop down and see the federal recommendations that we've, we've laid out for mental health. Back to you, Jack. Yeah, so, you know, the, uh, the solutions here are many and varied and I think um, there's 407 people now on the uh, attendees on this, 408, and I think there may be 408 potential solutions. What I think we want to make sure, as people understand, is that we need to get people talking about mental health. This is, as Ben said, the moment in our history where we have a unique opportunity because of the prevalence of stress and anxiety. Now is the time when we can do this. So I think, you know, um, the specifics are we want to get people working. Now, this is not a call for indiscriminately opening the country. We want to make sure we protect people from the virus, but we're an innovative, creative country. We can figure out how to get people working so that they're not unemployed while still maintaining social physical distancing and safety from the virus. In the midst of that, we want to get people connected. There are lots of ways. Here we are, 408 of us connected. There are ways to connect people. My family grew up in a small town and there were the Lions Clubs and the Rotaries. There are ways to connect people across space that allow for physical distancing and yet social connection. We have to take the best of what we have and invent those things and support those and find funding that provides support for those so that we can get people connected. Um, this next one uh, is a tough one right now. We wanna get people the facts. There is a unfortunate um, backlash against science right now in the United States. And I think we can continue to push the facts related to COVID, COVID infection, the impact of mental health and behavioral health services, we have to continue to push the facts on what is happening and what are the potential solutions. And then we wanna make sure we get people care. And what I mean by care is we need to make sure that primary care and behavioral health are fully integrated, fully aligned, fully in the same effort. People aren't their body and their brains, their minds and their spirits, people are people. And we need to make sure that the care reflects all those aspects of people. I think one last piece I'll say is that any, um, the mental health should be part of COVID recovery, testing and tracing. We have this new workforce of COVID infection tracing. And really that's a group of people who are gonna be contacting tens and, thou uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of people in the coming six months to identify their risk of the infection. At the same time, that group could also be ascertaining their risk of severe mental health problems with a, with a small amount of training. The COVID-19 tracing efforts could include mental health such that we could identify, refer, and get people the care they need. Primary care can be a, a, a natural component of that COVID-19 infection and mental health tracing effort. I'll turn it back to you, Ben. All right, thanks everybody for your time and attention today. Lots to discuss. We already went over our time, so I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly. Thank you. Thanks, all right, let me click on this. Um, thank you all. I just wanted to, oops, not go too far. Hold up one second, can get back here? It is not going back. Um, nope. Nope. 
Okay, let's see. I wanted to take just a moment to just kind of, uh, maybe it's because I'm the yoga teacher, but just like sit and breathe and, and really, um, I think it's a really devastating um, amount of suffering, like just sitting there and looking at that map and thinking about um, how many folks are really suffering right now. And it was really inspired by on our prep call, Ben said, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think it's a really important opportunity for us to really lean into how much people are suffering in this country. Um, so I work at Mental Health America. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is the patient perspective. So we're a national mental health advocacy organization. Um, we've existed since 1909, have affiliates across the country. So yes, we have that history working with people, working with people directly. The information that I'm going to talk about today is actually from our online screening program. So um, in 2014, we developed, uh, we launched this program, um, have had over 5 million people complete these online clinically validated screens. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we're seeing from that population specifically at a kind of higher level um, and then what we're hearing from them in terms of what they want and maybe some of the, you know, some of the things that people are looking for now that can help shape how we rebuild and expand and make better mental health resources. Okay, um, so I'm not going to read the slides, um, but wanted folks to have that information to see it, but essentially what we're seeing is um, a really intense overall increase in folks um, looking for uh, mental health resources, um, particularly around depression and anxiety. Our mental health screening program, most of the people who come to us are people who are not on MHA's website, but people who are Googling depression tests. Do I have bipolar disorder in the middle of the night? Most of them are young. So um, we're seeing huge increases in the people looking for depression and anxiety tests, but also huge increases in um, in severity. So we had a 370% increase in um, anxiety screens and a 394% increase in depression screens in May compared to January. Um, and as ben, ben mentioned earlier, the amount of young people who are ready to talk about mental health, we're also seeing really serious um, mental health challenges among the young people who are coming to us um, with uh, nine out of 10 screening moderate to, severe for, moderate to severe for depression and eight out of 10 screening moderate to severe, to severe for anxiety. Um, we also have looked at some um, information about what people say is contributing to their mental health challenges, and actually far more than COVID specifically, um, I think was mentioned earlier, most people are saying that loneliness and isolation is actually one of the biggest contributors to why they are having increases in stress, in anxiety, and depression. We're even seeing increases in um, risk across psychosis and severity across other mental health screens too, so not just depression and anxiety. Um, we're also seeing dramatic increases in line with the projections from the report that was just discussed around people thinking about um, suicide daily or um, self-harming. So we're seeing a lot of challenges um, in the data that we're collecting directly from people looking for help. Um, but I think also one of the, oops, one of the interesting things about um, the platform that we built through MHA is that we've been tracking what people want. Why is this going back and forth? Sorry, y'all. Um, we've been tracking what people want as well. So the biggest things that people say they want after taking these screens are not necessarily treatment. Um, it's more information. It's do-it-yourself self-help tools that they can use themselves and connection to people like them. Um, and I think that, you know, as, as I've said multiple times, you know, taking this period in history where we have such a great opportunity to build so quickly, uh, the mental health services and, and healthcare services in general, but mental health specifically, was not built with the perspective of people seeking care in mind. And I think that we have, we now have this data and we have this really important opportunity to kind of reimagine what we'll build for people moving forward. Um, and we've seen a really big demand for peer support and think that that can play, you know, the peer support specialist workforce, but just training lay people and supporting one another and helping folks navigate care um, and, and resources is a really important opportunity. Um, for us philosophically, philosophically, but from what people are, people who have no understanding of, you know, designing healthcare systems are also saying to us. Um, 
And um, you know, the existing peer support services that we see across the country have largely large shifted online. That's where people are looking for support. And I think you know, what we're hearing from the, from the patient perspective is that yes, people are suffering a lot, but we're finding a lot of hope and strength and empowerment and self-management tools and techniques, whether that's for depression or for other kind of healthcare conditions in community. That's how people have historically healed and thrived. And I think this is a really important time for us to consider that and design resources around that. And here's, oh, we have some, I uh, just wanna flash it really quick. Um, we have a bunch of resources on our website specific to COVID-19 um, and you can take uh, mhascreening.org or screening.mhanational.org for folks who are interested in the screening program specifically. And I'll turn over my time, thanks. Okay, so some great presentations, very thought provoking. So I'm gonna start out with a, a couple of uh, big questions. Um, so uh, Ben, in your opening statement, you, you talked about we, we haven't had our A game. What, what does the A game look like in your mind? I got a couple of answers to that one, Arthur. So one, I think the A game would imply that our country had invested properly in the things systematically that it actually needed. I mean, let's just pick on public health for a second. So for the last two decades, the rate of growth for public health investment has been relatively flat. So you haven't seen a huge increase in the amount of money that has been put into public health. I mean, when we spend $3.6 trillion in healthcare and we can't even put just a bit more in public health, it seems a signal. So our A game would mean that we would have actually had a robust, properly invested public health system to fall back into. That's number one. Number two is I think that we have to go back and do something that has been undone for too many years which is to reunite the triplets that were separated at birth, as one of our friends and colleagues has always said, which is primary care, public health, and mental health. So it's almost impossible to have an A game when you've got three tribes that are basically you know, working on their own and sometimes in, in partnership, but in many times just in their own relative silo. And we've got to figure out a way to bring those things together. So the A game looks like proper investment, which can be done at a federal or state level, as well as proper incent incentivizing folks like public health, like primary care, like mental health to come together and be the family that they actually have always wanted to be. This is for the whole uh, panel, but uh, I, um, I like what you're saying about public health. I, I, prior to coming to APA, spent 20 years of my career, actually about 30 years total, uh, in not what people would traditionally call public health, but working in mental health and, and substance use but trying to do it from a public health perspective. And one of the things that this, this crisis has really uh, drawn out for us is the importance of, of public health notions being applied to mental health. Um, so I was wondering if you all wanna take that on and describe what you think that that might look like. And I wanna uh, put it around the frame around, and if you could kind of put it around the frame around a, a population-based way of working. Uh, and I'll just say that one of the challenges, as you were talking about challenges, Ben, that I think we've had in our, our, uh, mental, our approach to behavioral health is that it has been all focused on people after the fact, and usually people in crisis. And so what public health does is it, it gets us thinking about how to get further upstream, how to have whole population approaches and not just focusing on people once they are ill. So I'm wondering if you all could talk about that and the, per, the, the benefit of mental health and behavioral health taking on more of a population-based way of thinking about our work. Well, so I'll, uh, this is Jack and I'll just pitch in here. I think, you know, the, uh, what, what we see in this current, th this is a great opportunity to just try some combinations. And, you know, I think Ben's thought about the A game is exactly right. How do you, how do you create a system out of these three isolated siloed current systems? And I think one, one way to do that is think about the COVID recovery that we're in right now. And we have this way to trace COVID infection and the public health is really taking this on. They've requested 100,000 new people into their workforce. There's gonna be some potential funding, probably not enough, but we need to make sure that there's plenty of funding there. The, the second piece of that I mentioned is this mental health 
tracing? How do we make sure that COVID tracers who are saying, hey, you were exposed to the infection at the bank the other day or at the post office, your friends have this, we want to make sure, we want to get you tested. Hey, how, how are you doing mentally? How's your, how's your mood? How are you doing? Who's helping you at home? And actually teach those tracers to do some mental health screening, maybe screening uh, and referral. And then the third part of that is primary care. Primary care, while while many people say primary care was absent, primary care was has been anything but absent and has been a major player in identifying people who are at risk of COVID, who are suffering COVID. They've triaged people. They've converted a lot of their in-person visits to telehealth visits, but they're still seeing lots of people in person as well. That combined effort of identifying people who may be at risk of the infection, may be at risk of a mental health bad outcome, and then all the other stuff that patients are facing, whether that's preventive care and vaccinations or chronic care or you know diabetes and COPD or just checking in on folks, those that combination can occur right now without legislative effort. We can start combining, and I think Arthur, your point about the population brings back an old book called The Folsom Report, Health as a Community Affair from the 1960s that talked about local communities of solution. And it's based on the concept that problems don't have geographic and political boundaries. They have problem sheds. <clears throat> and that the solution is often the asset shed of who in the community can apply for that or apply to that. And in this case, primary care, behavioral health, and public health can combine to create the local community of solution to address the local population health efforts. Great, great. Um, does anyone else want to add anything to that? Um, I guess just to, I guess maybe speak to it more specifically, because I think one of my, um, one of the things we always say, right, is like, go meet people where they are, bring things to where people are. And I think that there's a lot of special considerations around that, um, particularly I'm thinking about youth and in school um, and how we can really consider and thoughtfully adapt some of the strategies around mental health promotion that we've been trying to build into schools into virtual and online environments because the impact, um, the likelihood that many kids aren't going back to school is pretty high, whether you're talking about college students or younger, for youth with disabilities who are not going to be in school, you know, receiving supports. I think that their youth and getting people support earlier is really important, but I think that there's like really unique considerations in how we can quickly adapt that in an online environment for so many young people, because it's gonna not only be what they were struggling with before, but it's gonna be the collective trauma um, and life disruption that they're facing now. Yeah, I got to comment on that one. That's just too good. Kelly, I 100% endorse what you're saying because, you know, roughly 30% of our kids receive mental health services purely solely through their schools. And when schools aren't in session, what happens to those kids? We know we've heard about this with food, with some of the other um, important social elements of care, but we don't often talk about it in terms of mental health. So it's an opportunity for us to get really creative. I mean, in schools in this country prior to COVID, we're more likely to have a police officer in than they were to have a mental health counselor. And yet we've got these kids that have robust needs that are frankly going you know, unaddressed. And so Arthur, full circle back to your question, if we're serious about embracing things like primary prevention, then going into our schools and beginning to educate, to prepare, to look at some of the social emotional development curriculum that goes into helping kids flourish. I mean, that to me is where we start to change the game. But unfortunately, we have not quite done that as a nation just yet. Yeah. Well, and I think that in combination to what Kelly said, it, it's not just schools, it's not just primary care, but how do we embed mental health expertise in all the places that people naturally go? We have a system that requires people to come to us or to, to mental health for practitioners, and really we need to turn that on its head and put the, the services and the outreach to where people go. Uh, Kelly, I, I wanted, I, I love, I mentioned that I love that, um, that uh, disruptor uh, award that you got. And I, I want to ask you about uh, uh, peer support uh, and how could that be a disruptor given the, the just the enormity of the challenges that we're facing? You, you heard what Ben and, and Jack talked about, that the study and just 
the impact that we can expect on this. Is there a role for peer support in helping us to address these uh, serious problems? Yeah, absolutely. I can answer that question in a number of ways. I think one of the things I've been talking about a lot is just timing um, and how long it takes to train a psychologist versus how long it takes to prepare and train somebody who's working in peer support. Um, when we're going to see this huge surge in suffering and right, if we're one of the problems we have before is like where referrals to what, right? So like when we're going to be identifying more people and referring them to things, we want to make sure that there's people who are going to answer the phone, right? Or or go, hop on the video call or whatever. So I think just sheer workforce numbers, the evidence is there to support a huge investment in peer support in you know embedding resources where people are, um, whether that's having peers. Uh, connected to primary care to when we're when we talk about this surge in alcohol and opioid deaths they're going to the emergency department way more people are going to show up there than than die right so there's there's a lot of need um, and we can quickly build the workforce I think some of the issues and challenges that we're seeing now um, are things that the peer workforce can specifically speak to so things like hope things like self-management things like there's going to be people who've never had to navigate public systems before who are going to have to navigate public systems. Um, just connection and community. I think the way that peers relate to people through their stories, but also through um, a lens of reciprocity and mutuality um, is really going to kind of shape, uh, shape the future. And I think this investment in not just making peers available, but like a public discourse about what peers are and how lived experience is important and how folks with psychiatric disabilities have a really, really valid, valuable experience um, can help shape and encourage even more conversation than folks are having right now to go a little bit further than just we are. It's OK to talk about stress. But like it's really okay to talk about all of these things and you know we're, we shouldn't be separating people into different boxes or or excluding people from different communities anymore great and talking about uh separating uh ben a, a few people uh keyed in on your notion about uh separating mind body uh and uh i forget what the third one was uh oh primary care uh behavioral health and um public health uh, there's sort of two versions of this, and I'm going to uh, combine the, the question. So part of it is, what kind of incentives are there for, or could there be for creating uh, a more integrated approach? And then the second part of the question, it's a fairly long question, so I'm going to try to summarize it and just say that there's a question about a lot of the deaths of despair overlap with the behavioral health challenges that we that you've identified um, and what might it not be better for us to think about uh, deaths of despair not just being uh, related to behavioral health conditions but also physical health conditions and thereby having a more comprehensive approach so sort of integrating this notion of why why do we separate out these things and what benefit do we get by putting uh, our efforts together yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll start on the first one and, and try and answer the second one, and then I know Jack's got a lot to add on the first one too. So when we begin to think about ways to incentivize a new type of structure for delivery, inevitably it makes us transcend a fee for service mindset. And I don't need to say that to many people that are on this webinar. You you've all you're all believers there. You understand that. The challenge is what does that look like, and how do you create some type of architecture that allows you to have a global budget for an entire population within a community? How do you create a way for a community to actually be accountable for all folks that are under the umbrella of that community? We used to think about this as the promise of an ACO, an accountable care organization. ACOs provided a new framework, a new structure for us to be accountable for more people. But yet, as many of us learned all too quickly, we did a couple of things not so great with the ACOs. We, we continued to promulgate the fee-for-service mindset within a lot of ACOs, and we didn't always integrate mental health seamlessly throughout it. So it was a missed opportunity and still is an opportunity, but is a new type of structure. So I'm a huge fan of thinking about global budgets, providing some type of, of budget that is set based upon the needs of that community, distilling it out through the proper venues to each of the organizations to manage their budget for their populations. There's ways to incentivize there. and We could talk about it forever and Jack will make that sound a whole lot nicer than I just did. The second part of the question though, I think is critical. 
that if we only looked at the ongoing trends around mental health without an acknowledgement on the increased of increased rates of chronic disease and frankly the multimorbidities that people who oftentimes have mental illness have with chronic disease then we are fooling ourselves that we're ever going to be able to see a decrease in any type of trend that we've got to approach these issues in a much more thoughtful and progressive way it's why many of us all of us on this call um, today have really focused on bringing mental health into primary care because you can do two things at once really well. And if you do those two things at once really well, not only can you hopefully see an increase in some of those health outcomes that I'm sure folks are, are looking for and striving for, but you can also see the promise of cost savings because we're delivering a much more effective and efficient way of care. Um, Jack, I'll, I'll flip it to you there. Thanks, Ben, and thanks thanks for the question from whomever and whoever all was curious about that. I think, you know, I'm gonna just talk briefly about sort of the variation between big P policy and small P policy. And I think what has to happen ultimately is how do we align the work effort of primary care that includes behavioral health with public health and community-based organizations that care about their community? That's the sort of long-term big P policy. In the, in the short term, I believe we need to think about relationships. Who do you have in your community that you have a relationship with in terms of a public health worker, a behavioral health worker, a primary care organization? Who are the relationships that the first bit of work can rely on relational care rather than simply the transactional nature of medicine today? So who in your community, and I ask the attendees to think about who in your community do you know that works in a different area of health than you, whether it's primary care, behavioral and mental health, or, or uh, public health. Call them and find out what, based on the relationship you have with them, you can do together. The longer term is this sort of can, uh, agreeing to start the slow dance of work together, that, we start, you know, you see somebody that you know and you start doing something around COVID that's COVID recovery related and that relates to school kids or older adults who are isolated or you provide really good factual knowledge to your local newspaper or radio, that's that sort of small bit. And then you start that slow dance of moving that to the organizations of primary care and public health and then into the federal and state policies related to that, that are the big P policies that we're a ways from. I'd like to say, wow, I'd love to see, you know, big P federal policy think about a combined um, financial pool that would fund community-based public health, primary care and behavioral health. I think we're a ways from that, but we're not a ways from me knowing the person in my town who works in the other in another sector that I can work with. And I would really challenge us to think about starting there that can then move and disrupt. I like disruption as well, and I'm proud to be on a panel with at least one disruptor, and I think several of all of you are as well, that can disrupt that and really move that up into large P policy. Okay, very good. So, um, have a couple of uh, other questions here that I'm going to uh, read for you from uh, our audience. Um, uh, effects of COVID, um, I think the question is, what are the effects that COVID is having on our pediatric population, not just adults? So if someone wants to hear about, and Ben talked a little bit about schools, but um, is there anything that you can say about uh, the effect on children? both effect and solutions. Go ahead, go ahead, Jack. No, I was encouraging Kelly to talk because she had those great data <laughs> from Mental Health America that had oh, some yeah. youth related data in them as well. Yeah, so, right um, oh, oh, sorry. Um, so we are seeing large increases in depression, anxiety, um, self-harm, suicidality among young people. I think too, um, one of the data points that I'm hearing a lot about is reduced uh, reporting of abuse in the homes, which is 
likely uh, more just increased incidents and like less abilities to report. So I think we're also going to see the trauma of the current experience um, for folks who are being, for, for youth who are being traumatized at home, they're probably going to, you know, have worsened outcomes there as well. Um, I think for, for my perspective, um, the solutions, I think young people just, they, they t right, when young people are struggling, they tell their friends. Right. So like there's there's this one approach of like, how do you how do you ensure continued peer involvement in a virtual learning environment? Um, I think that there needs to be serious emphasis on kind of training youth in supporting one another um, and in in creating kind of pathways in an online learning environment for um, for how to let somebody know if you're having a hard time. Because I, I think my biggest concern is really that they're not going to go back to school. Um, so I think that, you know, I haven't seen anything that's been created that's like, this is how we solve that problem. Um, but I don't know, Jack, it sounds like you. <laughs> so I just like to pitch in that I think, you know, this is affecting all the kids. All the kids are at home. They're all being affected. And I think one approach is try to protect our kids from this event. And that's, 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 that's our natural instinct is to protect our kids from this. But I, I was reminded of a study back from the World War II um, where they took kids out of London and they took them and put them in the bucolic pastoral communities away from their home with relatives or not relatives, just folks out in the country where they thought they would be safer. And then they they followed, not all the kids did that. And um, they did an analysis of those kids and the ones who had been moved out to the safe countryside actually had worse health and mental health outcomes than the kids who had stayed in London during the bombing. And so I think one approach needs to be not to protect our kids from what's going on, but to engage our kids in what's going on and to have these conversations. And I would love to see, um, I have a couple of uh, students in my house and I'd love to see a curriculum or some bit of work that I could, that would facilitate my conversation with my children about what they're facing being isolated, what they're facing not getting to hang out with their kids. And so I think we could do a good bit of work in helping families, by whatever definition you mean a family, and adults help kids have this conversation and engage them in this pandemic, not protect them from the pandemic. Okay, so we only have a few minutes left, so you're going to have to have a, a short answer here for this last question. Um, so we started by describing the most challenging set of circumstances that you could come up with for the mental health of the nation. And all of the, the, the solutions that you all have talked about have really been um, solutions that go outside of the, the box that we're, we're typically trained in. Um, so I, I want to ask about um, how do we get there? Because so many of what, so much of what you've talked about does not fit the mental model for how mental health professionals are trained or how physical health professionals are, are trained. Uh, we've talked about social determinants. We've talked about going to where people are. We've talked about whole population strategies. We, we've talked about a lot of things that don't really fit into the way people are trained. So in the last minute or so. Tell us how do we get from where we are to a world that is more like the A game that Ben started with. How do we get, what, what can the people listening today, what can they do now to help move us towards that, that ideal of where you think we should be going? I guess if we go in the same order here, I'll, I'll start. It begins with courage and Jack and Kelly both said this in their own ways, but we have to be uncomfortable having a conversation around mental health as a nation with our families, with our friends, we've got to go there. Uh, this is the time to do it. So it begins with courage and being able to speak up. From there, it takes action. We've got to be able to stand together and demand something different. If we don't move beyond kind of the status quo that was, then I'm afraid that this moment of reflection, this moment of an opportunity will just slide back into mediocrity. And that is not gonna be good for anybody. So how do we take action with this newfound courage that we've got talking to each other in new and novel ways. I think that there is a precedent for this and that we've seen change come about in the face of crises, but I believe that it really will take all of us to get there and um, that, that would be my start. I'll just add to that and say that I think the first thing is for the attendees 
to reach out to their partners and collaborators, the people that they have a relationship with. The first step is not changing the federal will. The first step is changing our will and our individual interactions with our partners who are in public health, primary care, behavioral health, make those phone calls and start doing something with the people you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say um, kind of on both of those notes, so on the courage and and the power of the people, right, is, is being brave enough to admit that we're wrong about a lot of things and that things that we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on education and investing in might not be right um, and that we have to openly challenge this like power paradigm of who has something valuable to say, who owns knowledge and uh, who gets to design how we make the world better. So that is a great way to end a really great discussion. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists. And Anne, I don't know if you wanted to say anything on our way out, but thank all of you who have uh, participated with us today. Uh, well, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me and um, really appreciate all of you for being on this panel. You are terrific. Um, and we really look forward to working across all three of these areas, public health, primary care and um, behavioral health. We're uh, so excited to have you here. Uh, many of you are part of the primary care collaborative membership. For those of you who have not yet joined the collaborative, we'd love to have you um, be in the tent um, as we work together on a set of challenges. We know we can do better as a country and this crisis gives us the opportunity to do just that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks.